Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jonathan Lipp, director of the Big Apple Film Festival, and uh, I don't think I turned on everybody's mic, so sorry. If you can <laughs> hello, test, oh. test, test. Hello, hello. Good. Test. Hello, hello. Yep. All right, hello. So um, we are talking about uh, PR and marketing independent films. Um, we are going to hear uh, different perspectives on the subject, so I'm going to allow, uh, first let me introduce, we have Michelle Danner, we have Renick Soholt, Harris Duran, and Jill Goldstein. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of them if they could uh, first introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about themselves and their background. So we'll start right here with Michelle. Hi. Um, I am a filmmaker. I just uh, finished principal photography on my fifth movie called The Runner. Uh, and uh, I just uh, today we closed on a distributor for the movie right before that called Bad Impulse. Uh, I live in Santa Monica, California. I'm the artistic director of an art center. And uh, we also have a film festival called Cinema at the Edge that's starting next week. And uh, I watch about over 100 shorts a year of up and coming filmmakers. Uh, I'm Renick Sohol, and um, I, I guess I'm a filmmaker as well. I, I had a, a, a documentary that played here at the, the Big Apple Film Festival back in November. Um, I. My day job is a television producer. I've been doing that for probably about 15 years. I work in nonfiction TV, anything from reality TV to uh, a documentary series. Right now I'm working on a, um, a four-part documentary series for MTV looking at uh, kids suffering from uh, addiction, <coughs> addiction issues. And um, my film, uh, uh, if I could say it, it's called Force Change. It's a, a film that follows four stories of people who left New Orleans because of Hurricane Katrina and didn't return. So I'm sort of looking at the um, uh, displacement of people due to global warming, and I'm hoping that my next project deals with that on a larger scale. Hey, I'm Harris Duran, writer, director, producer. Um, I recently made a movie called Beauty Mark, which is an independent feature that uh, was distributed by The Orchard. It's on iTunes and um, Amazon and all of that. Um, and I've made, I have a bunch of uh, narrative features in the works and um, my first short film actually played Big Apple, Story of Milo and Annie back in like 2014. I was an actor for a really long time. Um, and I also teach in the grad department at Columbia. Um, yeah, that's me. Hi, um, I'm Jill Goldstein, and I'm a publicist. I've been doing publicity for over 30 years. I own my own firm, um, which I have a small staff, and we've been doing entertainment PR, or I've been doing entertainment PR for that period of time. Uh, most recently, uh, publicity for Inside the Rain, which won Best Narrative Feature here at the Big Apple Film Festival Ooh. in October. All right, so uh, let me start first by uh, asking Michelle. Um, in terms of PR, when we talk about it, PR and marketing in terms of independent films, but you also work with actors. Um, so I'm curious, what can actors do um, for their own PR to sort of get themselves out there? If they're, if they're in a film, what can they do um, from the PR perspective? Well, if they're in a film that has gotten into you know, uh, Sundance or, you know, Toronto or they could definitely, because it's expensive to hire a publicist, right? <laughs> it's not cheap. She's right. Uh, so it would have to be one of those festivals, I think, that are, you know, because then they, they, when publicists usually want a six-month commitment, but, um, right? She's right again. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, I think it's certainly helpful to get you articles and to increase, you know, your social media. If you're an actor that is doing that, you know, that has a presence on the internet. So depending on where your movie is selected, uh, I think uh, you have to decide when is a good time. But of course, actors, um, you know, need publicists at some point in their career. They just have to pick when. And, and also they have to be ready to do the work because the moment you get a publicist, they're gonna send over a lot of interviews that you have to do, whether they're you know cable, televised, you know print, radio, you, internet. You just blogs. You just have to hustle and and work and show up. And uh, 
I have a publicist, and I'm like four printed interviews behind that have been on my desk for like weeks now that I haven't gone to. So it's also the moment you get a publicist for an actor, you have to know you have to do the work. Yeah. Can um, I add to that? I was an actor for a really long time, and um, so I was in a movie at Sundance and was totally broke, and um, there was another actress who was in the movie with me, and she had a personal relationship with a, uh, a PR person who then ended up taking me on because, you know, by paying her a little extra, she basically was doing the exact same work because she was going to get us the same articles into the same parties. And so it was a way of actually, like, getting a publicist when they actually weren't doing more work. So there are, like, some clever ways of making things like that work. Um, and that's one example. Yes, and I would yeah. like to also add yeah. to that um, <laughs> yeah. something that you both said, which yeah. was very important. When your film does get into a festival, uh, you can really establish some really great relationships with the film festival publicists. And just by reaching out to them and letting them know that you're available, because they're really the core of the film festivals and the publicity for the film festivals. And if you reach out to them and let them know that you're available, you'll do anything. You'll do radio, you'll do TV, because all of the publicity that you're doing for yourself in the film at the festival supports the festival itself. So then you start collaborating with the film festival publicists, then you start meeting other publicists, and it kind of works into a domino effect, and you begin rela uh, creating relationships with press in that market also that you should never forget, you should never you know, forget their card, their phone number, their name, put it away because, you know, when you're in town and you want to get more press, you can pick up the phone and call them. Uh, Renick, as a filmmaker, your film Force Change, for example, at what point do you uh, begin developing a relationship with a publicist? Is that in pre-production, once the film is complete, at what point do you start thinking about working with a PR rep? I mean, I think you... The earlier, the better. Um, I, uh, you know, at this point, I'm not working with the publicist. Uh, I should be. We'll talk. We'll talk. <laughs> um, uh, but I did work, in some ways, surreptitiously through through your company because she was repping the, the the film that played here that won the was it Inside the Rain? Inside the Rain, yes. Inside the Rain won Best Feature. Uh, film and mine won best feature doc and so I was included in the package that they did on new in New York one so I benefited from that relationship though I did nothing but answer my phone <laughs> so um, what I've learned in this is is uh, distribution and marketing need to be thought of when the concept of the film comes up you know and I think I learned this from not doing it and so uh, in the process you sort of figure out that like um, if, if it's not something you're thinking of from the very beginning, you might end up with a very expensive toy in your pocket that nobody sees, and the idea is to get it out as, as, as much as possible, um, and to know who your market is, and to, um, uh, to work with people, and build relationships so that, um, you know, I think it's a slow burn. You know, I, I, I won Best Feature Doc for, for this festival, which was great, and I played another festival down in Biloxi, Mississippi, and also won Best Feature Doc. So what, for me, I don't, have a publicist yet, but I'm working on winning awards at festivals to then gather the interest of a publicist so that then we can work together to try and build press to hopefully have a, a strong package when distribution becomes a possibility. Right. When a film secures distribution, I think often filmmakers feel that the distributor is going to work with the press, but Harris, for example, your film, when you yeah. signed with The Orchard, uh, did they do the press for you as the filmmaker were you responsible for that part so of it was both so we we got a pub they have a publicist and so we had someone um, that they brought on for the release um, and they did their own sort of online uh, advertising but you know certainly it's something that you need to take responsibility for and do your own press and do your own you know Facebook and add to what they're doing you know, because for the most part right now, you're getting, you know, companies like The Orchard or like Gravitas, you know, these, they don't want to spend any money, right? And so they did spend a little bit of money on a publicist who did, you know, she was great and did a nice job. Um, but in general, they're trying to keep the expenses down, which also, the less they spend, the less you owe them back. Because, um, yeah, because they're not just like, doing it for the love of it, they're gonna like then give you the tab, 
right? And you're going to have to event your your movie will pay for that. It'll pay back. Um, and so they tried to keep the expenses low while being smart about what they did. But but I, you know, my you know the film company bought Facebook ads, bought Twitter, you know, and really, um, you know, we're reaching out to like celebrities to like post things, and you have to be inventive. Yeah. But also, I mean, that's you know, in terms of an audience for an independent film, you know. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys have met like Emily Best from from Seed and Spark, who gives like a really good explanation of like um, you know doing like a crowdfunding campaign that the it's actually the crowd is more important than the funding because if you get them along the way if they invest even if they like five bucks they're somehow invested in your movie and they're gonna want to see it and they'll help promote it and you know when we did the release of uh, of my film I d we did like a a, a big um, screening of it, and I asked everyone there, please tweet about it right now, this second, while you're sitting in the theater, during the Q&A. And I've like put something up on the screen, and you can do the link, and I set it all up. So, And I said, independent film, we need you, so please help. Please tell your friends. And they did. People did. You know, and it really helped launch the film, and it, it did like, and it's still doing well um, online. You know, which you're like, oh, you put it online, how are you going to make any money? And we're actually doing well. And so that was a combination of what The Orchard did, that they put got us good placement on like iTunes. Because we didn't have a theatrical release. Because a theatrical release um, for an indie film can also be just like, ching, here's a lot of money, here's a lot of debt on the film, no one went to see it. You know, and you just put a ton more debt on the film and it didn't help your film at all. You know, and so you have to be smart about how money is being spent and what is the best use of money and how, what is the best way to, ha to have PR um, if you're not going to have like a big PR budget because that PR budget needs to pay itself back or it's a waste of money. So you have to be smart. Michelle, for your first film, How to Go Out on Dayton, Queens, um, did you have a PR rep for that? I mean, you had some name talent. You had Jason Alexander in the film, uh, which I'm sure probably helped Keen Press. Did you have a PR rep for that film? I'm trying to remember. We definitely did. We, we had theatrical releases both, I think, in 15 cities. I mean, it was a while back. Uh, so try, I can't remember who, but we did have. We definitely had a publicist. I mean, all the movies, you know, have had a, a, a publicist. But, I mean, you're 100% right. At some point, it's the production company that produced the movie is going to hold the tab <laughs> at some yeah. point or another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, they have to be, uh, how do you say, the judiciously distributed. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a really smart thing that you said, uh, the promotion of doing like a crowdfunding, yeah. and because then you have people invested in the movie, and it does take a village to get people to watch independent films. Yeah. yeah. But like anything, it's a time versus money situation. So it's yes. like for any independent film, like you can do it all yourself, but it's like how many hours in the day are there? Do you have to keep a full-time job? Like what are, you a what are you capable of? And totally. I, and I think that is one of the challenges. I also did the crowdfunding campaign and like I'm, I'm, I'm waiting, doing as much as I can and then I feel like you have to be smart about when to jump and when to say I'm going to spend this money and I'm going to hope that it, it has benefits. You yeah. Know? Because it's, it's, a, it's, it's not, you don't just have a, um, Usually, an independent film, you're struggling from the very beginning, so there's not always a, a set line item for marketing. You should, when you start mm -hmm. and budget, you should have it there. But you know, easier said than done. Sure. It's tough. It's tough but also, the crowdfunding for my movie was only a small piece, the rest was investors. So um, I just, the crowd was worth it. It was, it was addition. It was yeah, it was in addition, yeah. But I think everything boils down to strategy with a publicist, without the publicist. Everything has to do with, do you have a plan? Do you have a strategy? How are you going to do it? Is it going to be unique enough so it'll, you know, push some buttons? Uh, I think nowadays, since we're all competing with, you know, Netflix and everybody else, you have to uh, just be smart in how you're going to roll out, you know, a feature when it's a small independent movie. Um, I just want to ask a question to uh, Jill. How does a filmmaker, especially an independent filmmaker, stand out from the crowd in such a competitive market like New York? Uh, I mean, I'm just, just from my own experience, just saying, even with a film festival, when there's so much going on in New York City, film festivals, concerts, all these things, 
and here you are with a small, low-budget, independent film. How do you get the press to pay attention to you? That's a really good question. Um, and I think that also um, talks to what you were talking about regarding strategy. Um, you know, you have to have a hook. You have to have an angle. You have to have something interesting that relates and resonates with the audience that you're going to, obviously. And so one of the things is when you're putting together your film or you're at the end of, you know, um, completing your film, you should have some kind of idea of, all right, so what is my major message about this film? With Inside the Rain, you know, mental health disorders is, is clearly what our angle and our hook is. But every story, every film has a specific hook and angle, and that's what you're going to be basically presenting to the media in a package. And going after local media, such as New York One, or AM New York, or whatever it, ever it may be, it's going with the right package, presenting it with the right angle, something unique and different. Every film has what I call a distinctive selling point. No two films are the same, no two products are the same. And there's something that's gonna make your film different. And you have to figure out what that is. The distributor's not gonna figure that out. And that also goes on to including the point that when you do get the distributor, you need to be collaborative with the in-house publicist or the PR firm that's hired. I also do publicity for FilmRise, and we do a number of films. We do publicity for you know five, six, seven films a year. And the amount of information that the filmmaker gives us about prior reviews, about media that had wanted to do a review before but timing wasn't right, or about the audience they already had helps our campaign so much, and especially when there is a small amount of time. So you've got to think of it as collaboration with your distributor, not like, oh, hand it over, they're going to take care of PR and marketing. It's a collaboration between you and them, and then finding your distinctive selling point, and then hounding the media. <laughs> That's what we're paid to do. You shouldn't necessarily do it, but once we do put together the package for our clients and we have the distinctive selling point, we are on the media a lot. And, you know, we're tenacious. I mean, that's basically, you know, what it does, what, what happens. Uh, Renick, how do you, in terms of like finding your audience, for example, force change, uh, what steps are you taking to find your market, even without a PR rep, just on your own? Yeah, so uh, I, I I think it starts with social media and partnerships. Um, so uh, I am active on social media on all platforms. Um, I pay for marketing out there and it actually does help. You can put a little bit of money into Facebook and you can get more um, action. I don't know how much that action equates to people going to see the film, but you know, at least there's more likes. Um, and then, uh, and then partnerships like you know, like Jill was saying, uh, you you figure out what it is your film is speaking to, like what its message is, and then you look for people out there in the world that have those same messages. So, uh, for instance, I just recently uh, reached out to people in the psychoanalytic community here in New York who are dealing with anxiety around global warming, and so a lot of my film deals with PTSD, and so. Um, uh, I, I'm looking at ways that other people are interested in my message and that we can help each other. And that can build small little nooks of, uh, of people who become aware of your film, uh, you know, one group at a time. Uh, Michelle, I just want to say one yeah. more thing. I think all of this thinking, this strategizing needs to happen in the development stages of your project and certainly, for sure, even more amplified in the pre-production because then you'll find yourself with a movie and you don't have a hook and, uh, and, and you, you, know, you don't have that, that, that road that will help you. So I think all of this needs to be thought out early on. I just wanna say, uh, it's also important to have a publicist for the launch, your festival launch, like to hire a publicist just for like the month before, pay them just for a month. It's really important. We premiered at the LA Film Festival, rest in peace. Um, and um, and so we had a publicist for for a month, and that's how and you know they're hounding. It's how we got our Hollywood Reporter review. It's how like buzz started, and how we you know ended up playing a lot of festivals and winning a lot of awards. And that really was the the publicist calling these people up. And the publicist, it's not just calling them up; they have relationships 
right? So you can call everyone you want, but if you don't know them, you're just a stranger calling. But it's their relationship that you're paying for. And so you can find someone to give you a good deal. I mean, I think we, it was like a friend favor. I think it was like maybe, it was around like 5K, who you know, was, for just for like a month. Who was your publicist? It was, um, let me Google that and I'll look it up on my phone. I get back to you. Jim? No. Jim? Dobson? No. no, let me look it up for you. <laughs> Definitely wasn't me. You're always <laughs> looking for people to recommend good this was publicists. LA. Yeah. <laughs> that is for sure. It's yeah. really hard to find a good publicist. Uh, what about the uh, outside of traditional media, um, social media? Uh, what are some strategies, perhaps? I guess I'll ask each of you. We'll start with Michelle. What are some strategies you can begin with on social media um, even before you get into production? What are some things you can do to start building that audience? Um, I mean, it all depends what, you know, what's the hook. It all has to do with maybe casting. Like, for instance, this movie I just did, The Runner. Um, it stars Cameron Douglas, who's the son of Michael Douglas. And some of you may have seen all the interviews he's been doing about the fact that, you know, it was just well publicized. He was in jail for seven years for dealing drugs. And so the movie that I just directed has to do with kids and drugs and our kids falling through the cracks. And, um, you know, I saw him on an interview and the interviewer said, do you think you're a good actor? And he said, I am. I know I am. And it was that moment that when I want to work with him. I know he's a good actor. And the fact that there's that angle in the story, because it's about a kid who's selling drugs and his car crashing, but he was that kid, uh, is an interesting angle. Now, we haven't started yet. We're just at the editing stages. And we do have a publicist on the movie. But, you know, the, the thing is that you can't, people have ADD. So you can't start too early, I think. You have to do, I don't know what you all think, but I don't think you can start too early. Um, you know, you have to push your, your social media push a little bit closer to, to the release. And if not, because especially in independent movies, it could take forever, I mean, I mean forever, you know, oh. like more than four months to finish your movie. It could take, you know, close to a year. So then it's like people just, you know, they have fatigue if they've seen you push, push, push too much ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Prodigy, it was Prodigy. Prodigy, oh great, yeah, okay, yeah, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Renick, in the development of Force Change, what did you start doing on social media to kind of get the audience um, I, I had a, a Kickstarter campaign, and I feel like that was when I sort of started having a social media presence because I needed one. And um, I, I hired a publicist for that. It wasn't the best experience, so I also think it's important that you hire the right publicist yeah, yeah. who has uh, experience in the thing that you're doing, uh, not music if you do film. Um, but uh, uh, social media, I think, you know, it's, it's again, I do, I, do, I do small paid social media uh, uh, bursts, and I try and make sure that, like, the information that I'm putting out there is um, adding information to the world that is helpful to the people that are interested in the thing that you're making versus just advertising yourself and, and making sure that, that you're, you're, you're spreading a broader message to the people who are interested in that. And, and I think it's a, a, you have to work at figuring that out. You know, my film is based around people who left New Orleans. So I thought people in Louisiana, specifically with Nor New Orleans, would be the market, but recently, I didn't get into a festival down there, and they said that the people there were too traumatized by Katrina mm -hmm. stories, and they didn't want to see it. So um, I thought my market was there, and it was like, actually, it's too close to home. I need to find it like a step away. So maybe it's Texas and Atlanta, or so, you know, like it's. So so I feel like you got to figure it out, and find out where your market is, and it's a, it's kind of a, it takes a little time. And f Facebook, you can micro-target, like do that Cambridge Analytica shit. Right, and so you can, and then you can see who responds to it, and then change, like how you pay for things in the future based on like, oh, it's really like women over sixty who watch my movie, right? And like really like micro target, you know. I also think it's really important that if if you're working on a, um, a documentary or, or not, you know, a full length feature film, the cast should be um, brought to the table to use their social media and start, um, start texting and, and putting on Facebook 
whatever they can about the film, whether they're in, in whether you're in production, pre-production, post-production, when the film's coming out, because to exploit the followers of your cast and or the subjects of your documentaries is key, because they usually have huge followers. Um, in addition, start thinking about assets that you can be dropping on social media. That's really important and should be thought of in the editing room, such as trailers, exclusive clips. Those are things that are really important for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, that you're kind of teasing. They're not advertisements. You don't have to pay a lot. They're clips, they're trailers, et cetera, but they start teasing the flavor of the film and start to engage your audience because it's one thing to get your audience, but you really have to engage them. And that's really, really important, and that is somewhat of an art. Yeah, I was just, I was just speaking to someone before about social media, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I was saying I think one big misconception is that people b think that a like is an engagement. It's not, really. No. I think comments and interaction, that's engagement. A like, you press, that's something that takes half a second. It's not really engagement. Exactly. But. And we're really lucky, I have to say, with Inside the Rain, because you know the writer, director, and star um, Aaron Fisher, so he's got OCD. So he's constantly <laughs> reacting to every comment. And yeah. you know, I speak to the producer and he's like, what is Aaron doing? And I'm like, this is a blessing. What are you yeah. talking about? He's engaging yeah. with every single person who's interested in his film. And that like never happens, never yeah. happens. You're never gonna see George Lucas do that. <laughs> He knows it doesn't have to, but yeah. it's pretty amazing. Does anybody have any questions? Let me open this up for a minute. Does anybody have any questions? Questions? Yes, go ahead. So you guys talked a lot about you know, trying to PR marketing and independent marketing. Um, and a lot of us, well, before you tip it, you usually start off doing shorts and sort of like building that resume to get people fun and make it feature. What kind of things would you recommend? And obviously, you're doing it short. You're publishing some awesome stuff. So, what kinds of things would you recommend to people who are like starting out? That are in that space where they're doing shorts. Really, short when I made my first short, Milo and Annie, um, it was really about social media, you know, and it was about, um, and I did like, I went to a lot of seminars like this to like learn like what do people have to say and something that I thought that was really smart was this idea that, um, that social media should be an online event, they, that, you know, it's about engagement, it's about, but it's about like every day that there's something new for people to come and see, you know, and, and, um, what I did was, you know, before I even did the, the crowdfunder, I built up the social media presence. I made sure to get a lot of followers to, um, you know, and just personally asking people, like, please, I'm making my first short. Please, you know, I have a dream, you know, like, and it was from that point of view. And people were like, yes, I want to support your dream, you know, and yes, I'll like that. And then those same people were who then I hit up for money, you know. Um, please give me money for my dream, you know, and you get like one of these, but you got to really use it, you know, and then those people really support and then they came out and they, you know, came to see the film and, um, and those are the people who spread the message, but you have to do it yourself because yeah, you can't afford um, a PR team, but again, like, you know, Facebook advertising is cheap, you know. Also, try to get into festivals that, and, and try to get your shorts into festivals because a lot of the festivals that we've been at, they have their shorts, and that's where you can just start the networking and start all of you know the the dom domino effect, I guess you could say. Yeah. And you, and at festivals, you can say to people while you're ha doing the Q and A, please like our my Facebook page. You know, this is the only way that anyone's ever going to see this movie. Please like this Facebook page. You know, and they they do. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, I have a series just a pilot stage right now and the development manager is screening. Should I not do things like share an image like a manga for a poster that's just gonna get the rights and everything on social media or anything like that before I hear anything from them because it might come out with a 
is it that they're they're looking to see if they want to work with you on this or so you haven't filmed anything you don't oh i mean i think you can i mean it, you're just sort of building up your there's nothing to put out really right so it's just liking a page well, there's, um, we have posters I also think it's a unique idea, something that's very, very unique. You may want to hold off if the poster gives the idea. So it gives, you know, a lot of the times you have movies coming out, it's like the same movies, you know, or, you know what I'm saying? If it's like a, a new zombie thing, <laughs> they, I'm just saying, as an example, um, you know, you're, you're just the very beginning, beginning stages. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't mean to say you have to wait till the last minute, you know, obviously. But I think that if you do it a year ahead of time, it takes time. I think in the independent world, however, it does take time to build that audience. You, you can't do it a month before the release. You've got to do it months before, but not like, you know, two years before. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. Is, this is for TV. Is that what you're saying? So you're pitching it to like a, a, a network or a, a Netflix or something for it to be picked up, correct? Down the line. Right now is the production company. Yeah. No, right now, I'm sorry? Right now is the production company. Oh, okay. Are you oh, wanting, the production company. Are you okay. wanting to shoot a pilot and then try to sell the pilot? Yes. I think it's too soon, honestly. But, you know, hey, that's just me. I only, guess, yeah. yeah uh, and the only reason being is that once you do have money on the table, there's, you know, you're, you're, you sell yourself, you know, you sell your soul to the devil a little bit, right? So, therefore, they're going to want to tweak marketing. And, you know, that's one thing that also I think filmmakers or even, you know, television documentarians and producers sometimes might not understand. And I understand why they wouldn't want to understand it. But once there's money on the table, you're not going to get carte blanche creativity because, you know, you are going to always have to answer to someone, right? So if you're putting marketing out there prior to that, the money being on the table, they might be like, well, why'd you put that up there? I don't, that's not, you know, that's not the positioning we're thinking about for this at all. You know, get it down. And you don't want them to start, like, with an uncomfortable feeling. I think it depends on the, the, the scope of what your project is, the level of where it's at. So, like... If you are, if you're producing something really low budget, then yeah, you're gonna want to do that to build an audience. But if you're, if someone else is gonna be, if Netflix is producing this, then you don't need to do that, and you shouldn't do that, right? Because it's for what purpose are you doing, doing it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's like, um, yeah. I mean, I have projects where I wouldn't start a Facebook page because the people that we're talking to are, it's like a different level. You know, but if it's like a small indie film, you have to do that work. It just depends on the scope of what you're looking at and what the use is, you know? If you're trying to get a production company to make something, I think the relationship with the production company is more important than trying to market at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have a question up front? Yeah. You know, I think the tricky thing here is you're talking about release, you know, release marketing versus brand awareness versus brand awareness marketing. But I think anything that's too early for the final product is a bad idea, right? So would it make sense for someone to build up their brand as a filmmaker as opposed to like a product, a short film, a feature, whatever, and find ways to do that? I think you're always building your brand as a filmmaker. I think from the moment you decide you're a filmmaker, you're marketing yourself as a filmmaker. And so everything you do on social media, everything that you do in public is trying to show that you are building a track record, that you have a strong point of view, that you have an independent and distinctive point of view, and that, um, and that you're working. So I think you're always building personal brand, always. Any other questions? Um, I, had a, I, was gonna, I had a question, uh, it was just going to be for Jill, but actually now I'm just curious to get everybody's opinions. We'll just start with Michelle. Um, how do you all feel, uh, how important is traditional media nowadays, now that we have social media? Is it just as important as it used to be, or do you think that's changing? And you mean by traditional media, like? The New York Times, or the Village Voice, or, you know, now that we have Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, how, how important is it? For traditional press? Well, I mean, I think if you have a small independent movie and you're doing a, a theatrical release in New York 
and in LA, you certainly want to have the LA Times, the New York Times review if you feel that it's that kind of a movie that, you know, there's some movies you're better off not getting them reviewed, I think, <laughs> because the press can just be vicious and they're always looking for an angle uh, to, I mean, you know, and, and f for big movies, obviously. I hear Cats wasn't that much of a disaster, but there was the herd mentality that just, you know, brought it. So, I mean, I think, but, but you know, they'll be able to withstand it. I don't, can't remember with the studio that produced Cats, but they'll live. But, you know, with a small little indie movie, you get destroyed by, you know, someone at the Times that's in a bad mood that day. Uh, <laughs> you're maybe better off doing your push on social media, you know, getting your fan base, getting people to go on Rotten Tomatoes without reviewers, and just have an audience, you know, like rating that's super high. You know, 80% of people loved it on Rotten Tomatoes, audience score. And no press, because I got screwed on one movie where I thought we had like 15 cities. And I thought that all the reviewers, from what it was explained to me by my publicist, that all the reviewers in all the cities were going to weigh in. Well, turns out that wasn't the case. It was only six reviewers that weighed in at 11% and 11% Rotten Tomato score. And that was just so horrible. And then we had another eight reviewers that wrote about the movie that loved it but they didn't count on Rotten Tomatoes because you have to be, um, what is it, certified or? Yeah, you have to be a certified, certified. Rotten Tomatoes so reviewer. So we're sitting, yeah. yeah, we're sitting with like uh, 24 reviews. Six of them were bad. The others are great, but the others don't count. So only the bad ones ended up counting. <laughs> so, you know, that's, I don't know if that answers what you're asking, but I just think sometimes if you have a little movie and depending what you have, you know, which is a friend of mine just released the movie at the Lemley in, in L.A. And here, I can't remember, here in a small theater in New York. And the New York Times and the L.A. Times destroyed them. I mean, they just killed them for everybody to see and Daily Variety. Um, and I went to see it. It wasn't that bad. It was like an independent movie. So you have to be careful because, you know, the press can be quite vicious. So do you need the support of those outlets? Well, it depends, I guess, you know, what your movie is. Yeah. All right. Uh, Renick, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's a very enlightened view. If someone offered me a New York Times review, I would take it. No, I'll take it. <laughs> I'm not saying it. I wouldn't take it. <laughs> um, you know, overpaying 20 bucks for Facebook ads, for sure. Um, uh, but I just, I think in a, 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 a fractured market where um, attention is spread out, I think, it's, I think it's all important. Like, I wouldn't say, like, you know, traditional brands are unimportant, so now let's focus on the new media. But I also wouldn't say new media doesn't have enough reach, so still focus on the things that you can trust. Like, look at all of it. I think all of it's important. Um, I would agree with that. Um, I think, you know, also depending on, you know, your PR person and their relationship, sometimes on a really small indie, the, uh, like a big outlet will say, heads up, we hated that movie and we're not releasing the review. So depending on the relationship, they will actually say, we know we will destroy this movie, and so we're not releasing it. So they'll tell the publicist we fucking hated your, the movie, but we're not releasing it, depending on the relationship, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah. That's true. Um, and just getting back to the original question, traditional media is still very important, I, I believe. Not to take anything away from, you know, Rotten Tomatoes, because I don't, I don't consider Rotten Tomatoes traditional, but very important. Um, and online media, very important. YouTube reviewers, very important. Um, got a thumbs up there. Uh, especially with the younger generation, with the millennials um, that are listening to podcasts. I mean, I'm old. And I was, you know, when podcasts first came out, I'm like, that's like listening to the radio. Like, no. And then now I realize how important podcasts are, and I try to get all of our talent on them. Like, that's like, you know, number one tier for us. Uh, but it also gets back to the assets. When you get a New York Times review or an LA Times review or an LA week re Weekly review, that's something that you can utilize within your press packet and within your poster and with all of the assets that you're using to market your film. And so therefore, yes, maybe, you know, Roger Ebert, you know, dot com, 
didn't like it, so you don't add that on your poster, but you know, let's say A.O. Scott loved it. <laughs> and so you would really put that in big bold type on your website, on all your, all your social, you would post that all over the place. And there are critics that are traditional that are branded, you know, that we know, like Thelma Adams is a very well-known branded critic. And, you know, what she says is really important. You know, Rex Reed used to be, you know, you have those critics, Peter Travers. Rex, is, Rex is in this building right now. Oh, is he really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I should say hello. Um, I got a good pitch for him. No, okay. Um, Peter Travers, like, you know, e even though they are associated with their publications and in traditional media, they are branded and well-known critics, and they still do hold weight. They do, in my eyes. Yeah. Maybe explain what a branded critic is, because I don't know if everybody, oh. everybody would know. Um, well, I, I guess a branded critic is one that has been around for a while, um, that maybe is not associated with one publication, but many throughout their career. So like Peter Travers, I think he started with People magazine. He might have even been with Time before then. And now he's with Rolling Stone. So it's like you're, you're following the critic, not necessarily the publication. And then in addition, there are critics that are freelancers and have been freelancers for a while that have their own following. And it might not even be social media following, but um, you know, a following of, oh, I, I usually like the films that this critic chooses to write about. And so that's where I feel like you know, they're important. And you could kind of do the analogy of the YouTubers that review the video games Yes, I do have a teenage son. You know, my son will go to those reviewers to see if he's going to purchase the video game. And he goes to specific YouTube reviewers that he knows that he likes the films, or he likes the games and trust and respect them. Critics are the same with us as an adult, so. Jill, overall, as a, as a PR professional, yeah. do you think it's better for a filmmaker to get a review in the Village Voice, a great review in the Village Voice? Yeah or a great review by a YouTuber who has 500,000 followers? You know, that's a really, really, really good question because another thing that I was bringing up, well, and, and Michelle had brought up strategy. There's so many different tiers to a strategy in a PR campaign and a marketing campaign in film. There, are, there is the strategy of getting people in the seats, in the theaters, okay? And that's where what you're saying, Jonathan, is the YouTubers who have 500,000 followers getting a good review they are getting the Rotten Tomatoes, you know, 500%, however many you can get. And you want people to see your movie and be, be in those seats, that's the most important. Now, if you're looking at your next film and your next studio to pick up your next film or your, the next film you're making and you want it to be in a higher tier film festival or you want it to be going directly to Netflix or Amazon, then you're looking at a different kind of press. So you have to... Think about which is better. It's all great, but you know you could have great reviews and then nobody in the theaters. For the filmmakers, uh, would you rather take the uh, the review in The Voice or the the YouTuber with half a million subscribers, Michelle? I think it depends on your demographic for your movie. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, I probably would take the YouTube reviewer. What if, <laughs> Renick, what about you? What would you take? Does Village Voice even print anymore? <laughs> I think so. Online. They're, they're online. They're online. They're online. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's about the market. You know, I think if, if your market is for millennials and younger, then I would go for the YouTuber. And if it's for, you know, older individuals or people my age, then I would say Village Voice. They know it. They trust it. They think there's something about trusting the brand that you're looking for the review in. And so it yeah. depends on the market. Harris? I mean, why can't I have both? Oh, I'm just saying if you yeah. had to choose. I'll, I'll take just, both. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm I mean, saying if you had to... I mean, I think that um, uh, I think that what you what you need for like a small indie film is like different types of validators, right? So when you're talking about the Village Voice, or you're talking about the Hollywood Reporter, or something like that, this is something that validates this film as like a real film, right? right? So that could be actors that we recognize. Like, what validates this film? 
you know, winning a bunch of awards at film festivals, right? And it starts to add up, like getting Independent Spirit Award nominations, stuff like that. Like yeah. it adds up. Right. And so that's like reviews plus awards, you know, and it's, you're just trying to create a, a marketing package and it's all of those things together. So to me, there's, there is real value in this is a good review in the Village of Voice because I take this one quote and that's a name that people have heard of. Yeah. You know, and I, again, I do think it is, you know, so what is the film with, if, with this YouTuber? You know, for, um, for my film, like having, you know, like high-end publications talk about my film and say good things was more valuable. Yeah. You know, because of the type of film it was. Right. Perception. You know? Like, right. Yeah. gets the validity. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I just want to also add, and of course, this is not the norm, but the Rocky Horror Picture Show and The Room got panned, <laughs> obviously, yeah. for many different reasons. But, I mean, look, th these are films that are making more money today than, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't have the numbers, but, I mean, Rocky Horror is still playing. Yeah. And The Room which is a disaster, um, is, is showing a midnight showing. So, you know, there's always a positive no matter what. No matter, you know, like, yeah. you've got to think of it that way. You could make the room. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have time for one, la one last question. Uh, go ahead, one final one question. question. Just going back to the beginning where you talked about bringing in your marketing considerations at the concert stage, what form can that take? When you're a writer-director you know, yourself and you're sort of putting together a small indie, who should you bring into that team to inform everything from potential genre selection or cast selection or given you a limited budget and not many choices, who's your team there that can inform you in building out the concept or the cast or the you know, festival strategy or the piece strategy? I mean, you, you'd have a producer, right? So you're, you, you're building a team, so it would be that, and then your therapist and your wife, right? I mean, um, and anyone who will listen to you. Um, but I actually think that um, when you're writing a movie, when you're getting it together, I think it's really important to actually like pitch people in, in like bars who don't wanna listen to you. Um, because then you get a sense of your movie and how people respond to it, and you start to figure out what your movie's about. You know, and if you can figure that out before you actually even finish writing it, that's going to help you in terms of like rewrites and what is your movie, you know, it, um, so that eventually there is a marketing strategy because you actually know that you have an angle, you have some unique point of view, a unique story that hasn't been told before, you know. But you can see like when people's eyeballs cross, like, oh, we've seen that before, or we don't care, you know. And I think like the thing that they care about is your marketing strategy, right? And Potentially, you could also think about um, maybe getting somebody who has a following on YouTube. I mean, in this last movie that I did, not the one I shot, but the one that's about to come out, um, Bad Impulse, I, um, you know, I was doing an interview at USC, and you know, I got Paul Servino in the movie, and um, um, Grant Bowler, this actor, and um, Sonia Walger, some very, you know, wonderful, reputable actors. And then all of a sudden, in the little clip we show, there's Rebecca Black. And all the, like, you know, 16 kids that were there were like, Rebecca Black, Rebecca Black. <laughs> and I'm like, everybody knew Rebecca Black. So it turns out I had a relationship with her, so I asked her to do, you know, a couple of scenes in the movie. She's actually really good. Um, but now that the movie is going to come out, we have a premiere in LA next, this month, she is going to, you know, tweet about it and, and Instagram and, and that's going to be helpful yeah. to the movie because she's got a big following so when you're at that stage and you're thinking about who you're going to cast, it's that casting stage, you know, who are you going to cast without making it exploitative and you know it's like movies just they do it and they just pick people that have following, it has to support the picture so it's not just you know that and it's not to exploit someone but if it supports it and it's helpful when it's time to launch it then you can also certainly think about that. All right, so uh, in conclusion, if each of you, I'll start with Michelle and work our way down, one last piece of advice you'd give regarding publicity, PR, marketing, and independent film. Michelle. I mean, you know, if there was one piece of advice is do have, well, two maybe, have lots of good conversations with people and do, you know, and really be prepared because you've done your research before you, you know, because once you're in it, 
it becomes this roller coaster. And at some point, especially when you're, you know, two weeks away from shooting, it goes really, really fast. So you want to be prepared. Renick, build it into the budget. <laughs> Harris. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think just in general for independent film, ask for help. If you don't ask, you don't get. You know, and you'd be surprised like the yeses that you get, but like all the like pretend yeses that you never got, that, you th that were no's in your head because you never asked, like that's not real life. You have to ask for things. Um, I think also building on what Harris said was um, also be authentic in regards to like how much you don't know. Like to this day, there's so much I don't know. You know, and it, it's okay to ask media, ask publicists, ask heads of festivals, how can I get a reporter interested in my film? I don't, you know, this is, this is not my wheelhouse. I'm a director, I'm a producer. And people really want to help people who are open and honest and vulnerable. This is just what I have learned in my years. And it has worked for me in getting placements for you know films and, and other clients. And I feel like that just works the best in life. All right, well, thank you so much. Michelle Downer, Rennick Solholt, Harris Duran, and Jill Goldstein. Right. Thank you all for being here.